I really wish I'd have got myself a cool background now. <laughs> <laughs> I will fix it in post. We'll yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You can do anything these days. You make it look like I'm next door neighbor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we put you in the room with us, right here on the table. <laughs> uh, today, guys, we're joined by Michael Stevenson, an English actor, writer, producer, known for his role as Ian on the show Casualty and the new short film, The One Note Man, uh, which we're super pumped about. Yeah, crazy thing about this short film is it has just been shortlisted by the Academy for the 2024 Best Short Film Oscar. So there's a possibility that might be an Oscar-nominated short film. How are you doing, man? So I'm good, thank you very much. Yeah, we we um we've actually we've, we've we're in the um, we just found out that we've shortlisted for the BAFTAs as well. So um That's so awesome. today the 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 battle. BAFTA voting closes today, so we're, we're all sat here in anticipation to see what happens there as well. So what, what do you guys find out about the BAFTAs? I mean, I know the, the Oscars, you find out what we do <laughs> in like a month or two. Uh, well, we find out about the BAFTAs uh, next Thursday, the 18th. <clears throat> so voting, it's quite a quick turnaround. Voting closes today, and then we find out on the 18th, and then we find out about the Oscars on the following Tuesday, 23rd. So we're going to talk about the short here in a second, but let's talk about you for a little bit. We know you're an actor. Is that what got you into the business and led you down the road of producing and writing and everything? Absolutely, yeah. So I've been a, a, an actor for the past sort of 15 years, uh, and I'm in a TV show uh, in, in the UK called Casualty, which is like the, one of the BBC's longest running uh, dramas. It's been on telly for the past 38 years. Not with me in it, not for 38 years, obviously. <laughs> uh, so, I've been, yeah, I've been there for, uh, for the past 12 years as a, as, a, as a regular character in there. And, yeah, just over that time, fell in love with the, the, the craft of filmmaking and to the TV industry and the film industry. Uh, and, you know, not just use my time there to, to be an actor. I've used my time there to, to the learn, uh, learn all aspects of the, the, the film industry and the trade and, um, you know, the, so, so the, produ the production side of things. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I've slowly started moving into that over the past few years. Um, and, and, yeah, and things, things have gone from, from strength to strength. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, so at, at what point did producing start to become a thing you were interested in? And how did that lead you to eventually doing this huge short film? Well, I've always been in, in, interested in the amount of people that it takes to make a production. Uh, yeah, uh, the reason why I got into acting uh, all the years ago was because I went on a, a TV set in, in the UK as a as a background artist, as a as, you know, as an SA, and uh, had never been on a film set before, and was just completely blown away with how many people it takes to to make uh, just a short amount of, of filming. You know, once once the actors have sort of blocked and everything, all these people just appear out of nowhere and bring lights on and microphones and makeup and costume and, and, and it, it just yeah it just amazed me and, and so I've always sort of that was the reason why I got into acting because even after you saw all that then it boiled down to these two three people uh, on set to to deliver their lines uh, you know under all that pressure but I think for me uh, I, I've always had a sort of background that likes organizing and I like organization and I like to have my uh, my fingers in lots of different pies, so I, I, I found that the producing side of things, you get to be involved in in every aspect, uh, from right from script development all the way through to final delivery. Uh, and a lot of the directors at, at work have always said, "Did I fancy directing?" Because I, I, I take a keen interest in the cameras, the lenses, you know what everybody's doing. I like to know what everybody on set is doing, and and, and take an interest in all their jobs. And directing is something that I've always sort of been interested in, but I, I haven't, I've never really had the confidence to, to follow it through, uh, simply because I know how much money it costs to make uh, any production. Uh, and I sure of hell hasn't got, haven't got the confidence to, to do it with somebody else's money. Um, however, finding the right people, finding the right people to do, to do the job is, is something where I think my, my strengths lie. Uh, which is why the production route is is always been appealing to me. But you you brought up two things, which is producing, just organizing a lot. You brought up money too. When I watched this short film, the first thing I thought of is this: it's supposed to have taken a hell of a lot of producing. Like it, it is a very ambitious short. Like the first thing that stood out to me is just like the number of locations you guys have, and I know at least for stuff I've directed, like company moves are always a a big deal, like to the budget of the crew. So like how, yeah. 
when when you're presented with this script, like what are what are some of the the problem solving that's going through your head of like how you're going to get this thing made? Well, interestingly enough, that was one of my first jobs as a producer was to tell the director and the writer what had to not happen <laughs> in the script because <laughs> it was even more ambitious than what you probably see. It was written. Wow. The, 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 okay. the, uh, the orchestra was the, the uh, Albert Hall in London. <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, uh, <laughs> yes, it's like New York's version of Madison Square Garden. It's like, right, we ain't filming there. <laughs> um, so it, it was a, there was a lot of it was watering down the ambitions of the initial script. Um, and actually, but what you see on screen is, is only sort of four locations, really. Yeah. Um, you've got in the interior of the theater, you've got a park. Uh, and you've got the exterior of the theatre, which is a cheat. They're, they're two separate places. And then the, and then the house. So um, ambitions-wise, once once we'd got rid of the big uh, the big desires to shoot at the Albert Hall and things like that, it was a much easier easier shoot to put together. Uh, but, but you know, come come with that. Every all the troubles and, and that always do. People backing out last minute, look at losing locations last minute. We we lost the. Um, the interior of a theatre that we really loved, we lost that the week before the shoot simply because, and we, you know, we, we did a recce, we, we did the final recce, and at the final recce, the, the, the venue informed us that we couldn't have smoke machines in there, which oh. the DOP, oh. it, it was just an apps, you know, it was an instant out for the DOP because, you know, oh. he needed his light, for, his, his smoke for his light. So we, you know, we had to quickly find out. But then luckily we were shooting at a time of year where theatres were dark. There weren't many productions in. So uh, they happened to have, there was something else uh, that came available. And the house, the, the house was interesting. The One Note Man's house, that was our most difficult find because it had to be perfect. We didn't have the budget to do a studio build. We didn't really have the budget to do a massive dress or something like that. So we, we went down the route of trying to find a house that felt perfect for him. Because we've done that in the past. You know, you, you, you do your best to try and dress an area to the character. And it can, you know, it, it can end up being costly and definitely consuming of your time trying to source all these specific things that suit the character, of which our character is very specific, yeah. in, in particular in his ways. And we spent months trying to find a house. We did a search up and down the country and, and nothing was coming back, you know, advertising for what we wanted and nothing came back. And then after a few months, we, uh, I was talking to a neighbour of mine. I'd kind of given up. I was talking to a neighbour of mine and they said, well, uh, a house next door to them was empty. Did we want to look at it? So I went round to look at it. But in doing so, they took me through their house. <laughs> and whilst walking through their house, I was like, hang on a minute, this is, this is perfect. Could, can we use yours? So it happened that we'd done a search up and down the country and we ended up using a house three doors down from where I live. Oh, man, that's <laughs> awesome. That's crazy. Part, of, part of the joys of the, the producing and things like that and what is, is for those little wins, it, uh, as much as there are um, hard times, there are these little wins that happen that, that, that are so exciting. The short film is not open to the public as of yet, correct? It, no, it it was it was on uh, Omeletto for a short while, but because okay. we it's with a distribution company now, so obviously we've got to keep an eye on the future of the film and sales and and things like that. So it was on Omeletto during the um, the Oscar qualification process, basically for for people to you know to create a bit of buzz and, and get it out there. But it was on Omeletto for not a not a long. Not a long time, I think maybe a month, month and a half, and we were already pushing like 200,000 views. So we wow. sort of had to yes. put a freeze on that for a little bit because although you want it out there and you want to create a buzz, you know, there is a desire for this to have an afterlife, you know, in terms of yeah. maybe bringing a bit of money back in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, so yeah, there's a, there's a sort of business element that we've got to keep an eye on. And, um, but yeah, it was, it was available for a short amount of time and, and had a great response. So uh, for people who haven't seen it then, who wasn't able to catch it on Amaletto, can you give a quick synopsis, quick breakdown of the short film? So our short film, The One Note Man, uh, tells the story of uh, a, a musician who lives alone. He lives a very sort of meticulous, uh, routined life. Um, and through that, his one sole purpose in life is that he plays one note within an orchestra. And his day is very much uh, the same. It's the same every day. He wakes up every morning. 
he uh, has a cup of tea, he has his breakfast, he picks up his instrument, goes to work, plays his one note, comes home, has his tea <laughs> and goes to bed. Uh, and then, then it repeats, his day just constantly repeats. And then something happens one day, and this is all on the lead up to Christmas, by the way. We, we tell the story, it's a Christmas time story. Uh, and uh, one day uh, during his normal routine, or I have to say that after he plays his one note, he's allowed to leave the orchestra while the rest of the musicians play on. Because his job is done, he can leave. And then something happens one day within the orchestra which delays his exit, which kind of turns his life upside down. And the story is about whether he takes the plunge and acts upon this moment that's happened to him, which could change the course of his life and definitely change the routine of his life. Or does he carry on? So it asks a lot of the questions of like, you know, what, what would we do in those situations and what are the rewards for stepping out of your comfort zone and, and chartering into the unknown? Yeah, it, I, uh, I, re- I really love the film. I love the uh, the whole conceit of it being Christmas and you're keeping time through the advent calendar and the chocolate. Yeah. The inclusion of the orchestra is great. I don't think you mentioned, but his it, his one note is played on a bassoon, which is kind of objectively the funniest instrument. <laughs> yeah, like maybe yeah. a tuba <laughs> would be up there too. But uh, yeah, well, I, I think what yeah. makes it so funny is you know he he goes through all of this preparation to set the bassoon up. He gets it all ready. He plays one note, and then he's done. And it's just that's yeah. where I feel the comedy really comes in. Yeah, and the the whole film like it. I didn't even realize until the end, but it's basically a silent film. Like the only voice you really hear is sir ian mckellen which yeah, who is another the film. crazy yeah, yeah. thing so what uh yeah what about this when you got the script was like this is a short you want to produce 100 percent. you know the amount, of, the amount of times you get sent scripts and you read scripts and you know I've, I've sort of worked on scripts in the past is that they're very um they're very very heavy heavy in their in their narrative and that's yeah. fine that has its place but i think at the moment in the world and, and more recently the you know the state of the world and, and the darkness that's going on it, it was a script that you picked up and you, you, you smiled at from page to page and I knew by the time I hit the last page when the you know when the the orchestra uh, orchestra crescendos and the, the audience are joining in you knew then that if you could get that right if you could make that film and you could make an audience leave buzz you know buzzing the same way as what the audience are on the script then you've got a really cool short film um so yeah so the, it was in, it was inspired the, the script uh, was inspired by a um our, our writer and director was um going through a bit of a hitchcock phase and he was watching a lot of hitchcock movies and uh, and listening to interviews with hitchcock and something came up in one of the interviews where he was talking about the film that made uh, the man who knew too much and at the beginning of that film, uh, he, te- he said the inspiration for the beginning of that film, which was just a single camera shot that pans in on, a, on an orchestra. And it's a wide shot and it slowly homes in on, uh, on a, um, a guy with a, a, a cymbals, with some cymbals. And uh, all the orchestra playing and it comes in and comes in and focuses. As, and this guy, right at the last minute, just plays his cymbals. And that's the one crash. Um, and he said that the inspiration for the opening of that film came from a, a cartoon sketch, a 1921 cartoon sketch by a British artist called H.M. Bateman, and called the One Note Man. Um, so he he looked it up and and he and he did a bit of research and he found the the cartoon illustration, which is um, basically like a, a series of sketches. There's no dialogue in the cartoon. They're just there's just a series of sketches which tells the story of. This guy who wakes up, has his breakfast, goes to work, plays his instrument, goes home and goes to bed. And he, that sort of sparked his um, imagination as to who this guy was. Why, you know, why does he play only one note in an orchestra? Is he, is he happy? Does he, does he do anything different at the weekend? <laughs> what, who is this guy? Like, and, you know, in terms of what we can do with films, and we, can, we can ask questions and expand on things. That got him, you know, that sparked his imagination enough to turn it into a love story. Yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. And I, I think what makes it so beautiful is that you don't have to just be in, you know, a musician to understand what it's like to be a one note man. It, in, in any field, in any life, uh, sometimes it can feel like you're the one note man. And I think that's what makes it so beautiful. It's, it, you know, he's going through a routine and a cycle. And then when that routine and cycle gets broken, it's not that uh, it's in disarray. He just starts a new routine and a new cycle. These moments come at us 
always these moments always come at us from from nowhere, don't yeah. they? You know, and and it's they never they never present themselves in in head on. They always creep up from behind or hit us from the side, and um, it's how we deal with them that that you know, paves the, the way forward. Dude, I was curious. We've been talking about this orchestra for the whole time. What was the casting process like? Like, of course, you've got you've got a great lead actor. You got Surrey and McKellen on the narration. But I'm also, like, curious, like, how you find a, a full orchestra worth of people to be in the film, find an actor that could, like, do great acting and also play violin and <laughs> bassoon and everything. <laughs> Well, going back to the producing side of things, you know, I, you, you very quickly learn as a producer the best way to get what you want is to hire the people that can give it, yeah, yeah. And, and don't try and do everything yourself. Um, and with the, you know, music isn't my forte. I've, I've never worked with, with musicians before, and I've, you know, I've, I've developed a newfound respect for that, uh, for that art form. It, it's incredible. So I, with the orchestra. Um, I found a, a fixer who, who puts together uh, orchestras and, and musicians, um, and she did kind of did all that for me. She, you know, uh, how the how, how it all came together with the music. Look, we always knew that the music was the third character in the piece. It's the you know it, it's it's the the script is written and demands. Uh, an amazing score and music composition. So really the first character that we needed to cast was the composer of which we did. So we, we presented the, the script to Stephen Warbeck, mm -hmm. who is uh, an Academy winning composer. He wrote the music to Shakespeare in Love and, and Billy Elliot. And we sent it to him uh, knowing that the music was so important and he fell in love with it straight away and got in touch straight away and said, I want to do it. I'm in. That's awesome. So, very early on, we had an Academy Award winning composer <laughs> attached to it. Yeah. And uh, that, that helps. <laughs> um, uh, and, then, and then we started to build a cast around that. We knew that Jason, uh, you know, I'm very aware of Jason's work within the UK. He's one of Britain's most loved actors, great character actor. Um, and some of the, you know, some of the characters that he's built over the years is just phenomenal. So I always knew I wanted to work with with Jason, but but he doesn't play, he, you know, he doesn't play the bassoon. But bless him, once he, once he found out Stephen was attached, and then uh, so he what he wanted in, and because of the type of actor that he is, he wanted to learn how to play the bassoon. Yeah. So we very early on got him bassoon lessons, and he took weekly bassoon lessons to learn. Yeah. Um, so much so he fell in love with it and his present to himself last year was to buy himself a bassoon his, his little luxury what he bought himself was a bassoon now he can be the real one note man or he, he, he can play more than one note yeah, now yeah. now he can be the real one note man yeah. <laughs> and he did like we, we presented that we did part of the funding for the film uh, was uh, was that I pitched it to a, a, a theatre uh, a, a, a producers fund that normally uh, backs theatre uh, it, it funds up and coming producers for, of theatre but I always knew that this film had the potential to to engage more than just film lovers um, and with I don't know if it's what if it's for the same for you guys in the states but over here like cinematic orchestra is 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 quite trendy at the moment and we're doing big like live screenings of Jaws and oh, The Gladiator yeah, yeah. all with live orchestra and I thought that the film because of the music element to it would be an ideal opportunity to engage younger audiences that, uh, that didn't that weren't aware of the fact that orchestras play the score to films per se or cartoons that they watch on the telly they you know they, they watch it and they hear this music but they don't necessarily know where it comes from so I pitched it to the theatre theatre uh, arts fund uh, that we would screen the film to a to a young audience uh, with a live orchestra and engage them with the fact that the live orchestra are playing the music to the film, and we did that before Christmas. We 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 invited there were nearly two hundred uh, local school children, and we uh, we screened the film uh, with a live orchestra, and we got the kids on stage doing some conducting and what have you. Um, and and they absolutely loved it. They went fully with it, and by the end of it, 
I looked down from above, I was looking down from above, and all the kids were stood up at the end of the film clapping with the film, to the, with the orchestra, that's, like the audience are. Oh, man. That that's, is, that's so cool. That yeah. is, because there's, now there's going to be those kids that are like, oh, when I grow up, I want to be a musician and score yeah. films and stuff. That's, that's sick. Yeah, and like so, so many times, yeah. like you just throw a film online and that's it. But we kind of like we get into film because we we have like communal theater experiences. We talk about films with people we love. Like that's that's a, that's a really cool, unique way of engaging an audience. It's really cool. Yeah, they loved it. It was great, and because you know, it got the, the the festive element to it, and I think it's something that will you know will will advance on next year. We can sort of take it's something that we can take on the road every year. So. The one note man should have a bit of a, a prolonged life. Yeah, I mean, well, the short film has been doing really well at tons of uh, film festivals. I tried making a list of all of the awards it's won, and I got about halfway through, and I was like, "I'm gonna be talking for ten minutes." It's been very, <laughs> it's, it's been very successful. What has that been like? You know, going to all these film festivals and and you know, seeing your hard work pay off that way. Yeah, it's it's a, it's it's funny the the film festival circuit. I've been I've been in, you know I've been involved with it for a number of years now, and I I still, if I'm honest, I don't know which side of the fence to sit on as to whether I enjoy it or not because <laughs> it's it's sometimes the most frustrating process of it all because you you know there's no rhyme or reason as to whether your film gets selected or not. It might be that it just doesn't fit that film festival's program, but it just so happens that that film festival you really set your heart on, and then all of a sudden another film festival accepts it that you don't necessarily know a lot about, and it just takes off, and then all of a sudden you, you're on your sky high. So <laughs> I guess like the, the 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 acting industry, like you you know you you just don't know what's around the corner, and we were very lucky that uh, Rhode Island Film Festival were the first to bite. And they 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 showed it, and we won. We had, we won the grand prize at Rhode Island, uh, which was our first festival. We we didn't um, we didn't finish post production until July last year, and we played at Rhode Island in the August and won, which meant we automatically qualified for the Oscars with our first festival. Wow! wow. Um, and then and then nothing for a few months. <laughs> no selections for a few months. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then not, and then Norwich uh, Norwich selected it in the UK, which meant we could apply for BAFTA. And again, nothing for months, and it just goes on like that. But slowly, it's a, you know a little bit like a snowball effect. You you start it starts small and starts to build and build and build. And um, yeah, getting feedback from the festivals is 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 great. And you can't attend them all. This is the thing: you can't attend every festival. So it's really we we got we had an email from uh, Cannes Indie Film Festival. Which again, we didn't, you know, we didn't particularly know much about this festival, but it turns out it's the, one of the most amazing little film festivals. So well attended, the crowds are well up for it, <laughs> and the, the festival programmer, you know, we were getting clips of them like playing um, rock music in between all the film screenings, and all the crowd are getting going and blah blah. And the, the, the festival programmer emailed us last week and said, "I just want to follow up on your wins. We won four awards at that festival." And he said, in all my five, six years of programming this festival, I've never seen an audience on its feet. Wow. And apparently, the bit where the orchestra are playing and all the audience are clapping, all the audience at Cannes Film Festival, Indy, all stood up and started clapping along. Wow. Um, and, you know, you, you, you're gutted that you can't have been there to witness it. But uh, it's amazing that it's touching these people in different parts of the world. Because I said, I think you know what's what's lovely about this film. It, it's internationally accessible mm. because there's no dialogue in the film. Music is the dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. It speaks to anybody all over the world um, without subtitles and, and things like this. So yeah, it's it's brilliant to to, to hear those things. Yeah. What's the timeline from finished film to now? Like, how many festivals? Are you submitting to? How many are you rejected from? Accepted to? What's just just what's the journey to rejected way re <laughs> rejected way more than you will see on, way more than you'll see on Instagram. Okay. Put it that way. Okay. <laughs> see, no one likes to talk about that, but like right, even the right. best films get rejected. Oh like, no, yeah. you've got you've got to be honest about it. You've got to be honest about it. Like it, I, it is. It's one of the most frustrating processes in, in, in I, I've experienced because you just go, well, why? I don't understand. I don't like. But there is no rhyme and reason, and the sooner you can just 
you know, you put your list out. I don't know how many film festivals we've applied to, and it's an expensive process. Yes. You know what I mean? It's yes. what's interesting. What's interesting this year is, you know, there's two, this two, yeah, two ways into the Oscars, and that is to win one of their qualifying festivals, which is historically all you could do, I think. But now, or in recent years, you can, if you if you get to the end of your festival run and you realise that you haven't won any of their qualifying festivals, you can release your film in LA for a week, huh. uh, or New York, I think you can. And because it's been released in a cinema, you, you automatically can apply. So this year and recent years, you, you've got the likes of some of the big streamers that are qualified yeah. for the short section, which wouldn't normally happen. Yeah. Um, and there's a, you know, I guess there's a conversation to be had around whether that's right or wrong. The short section in the Oscars is historically for, to put, to push and celebrate independent up and coming filmmakers. Yeah. And I, I do fear that if it carries on this way, you know, look at this year alone, last year, there weren't, I don't think there were many this year, there's four, five films, four films that have been made for Netflix and Disney and all these bigger streams. And you go, well, if that continues, then it pushes out the small indies that have historically benefited from this platform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens after this year and if it continues that way. Yeah, that is interesting. It's like you you've achieved so much, but now you you're at a whole new level of competition. Like your your competition for this award is Wes Anderson. Who? Who? <laughs> uh, you, you probably have yeah, you probably maybe. just a little indie guy. You know, does a is the BAFTAs similar? Like we're we're not from the UK. What's what's that process? So the BAFTAs the BAFTAs are our equivalent of the Oscars. Okay. And that's our that's our big prestigious film award and TV award. So it's yeah, it's the same. Um, so when you look at your film festival run, you go, well, yeah, okay. So the first festivals we want to hit are the BAFTA qualifying festivals and the and the Oscar qualifying festivals. Um, and it's a very similar process. You, you know, I think this year two hundred and something. Well, actually, it's a, it's a different process for the Oscars. You have to you have to win one of their uh, qualifying festivals, um, of which I think there are about 70. I might have got that wrong. It might be about 70. Um, and then the others are made up of people that have, uh, you know, paid for their film to be released or, or whatever, or, you know, gone in the sort of, I don't want to say back route. I guess it is a back route, but it's not, it's not, it, it would, it would have been classed as that a while ago. Um, but it's harder to get the Oscars because you have to win one of the festivals. Now with BAFTA, you only, you only have to qualify for two of their qualifying festivals. You don't have to win. Okay. You just have to qualify for two of their registered festivals, and then you can you can apply. So what that does is it means that in the outset for the Oscars, I think this year there were, I've heard varying numbers, but there were somewhere between 180 and 220 films that qualified. And that gets sliced down to 15, which is where we're That's at. That's awesome. And then from 15 to noms. In BAFTA, because you don't have to win, I think the qualification films is way above that. You, you must be into your thousands. And from that, it gets sliced straight down to 10. Oh, wow. Of which that's where, that's where we're at now. We're in the final 10 wow. for that. And then, and then same as the Oscars, that it goes down to the five nominations. Not to nerd out for a second. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an actor, so I'm a huge acting nerd. And I was looking at your Instagram before we did this. And I saw where uh, Russell T. Davies commented and was like, great work. And I was just like, oh, man, that's <laughs> sick. You know, I'm a huge Doctor Who fan. So I saw that. I was like, man, that's awesome. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Russell's, a, Russell's a, 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 a sweet, sweet man. He's also a huge casualty fan. Yeah, uh, which, which is great for me. That's the show. That's the show that I'm. <laughs> yeah, in. absolutely. You play Ian. He's amazing. For you know, for his, that's right. For as successful as as Russell is, um, and you know, he's absolutely huge. Obviously, with Doctor Who and stuff like that, he watches everything. He watches all the British soaps. Uh, he, he just there's nothing he doesn't watch, and you know, he he, he backs everybody. He champions all these uh, all these shows and. He's a, he's a great champion of, of British TV. So, I mean, we, we talked a lot about the award circuit and everything, but uh, of course, like, that's not, that's not the real reason you're doing this. Like, you talk so much about how much of a positive impact this film has had. 
how universal it is like after this experience like what what kind of thing do you really want to produce next like what kind of stuff are you looking for so i want to move into features next I, in, in, for my production company we we, we set a goal uh, like a two-year project plan of making three short films and with each short film we built in scale uh, like i said earlier you know with with me not having the confidence to direct yet, especially with somebody else's money, I definitely feel like there's a responsibility as a, as a young production company not to think you can do it all in, in one hit. Uh, so we, we, you know, we, still, we did one short film that was really low budget and then another short film that was a little bit bigger and always with a view to the One Note Man being our sort of uh, flagship, flagship film that might hopefully put us on a different, different footing. Um, so we, we, we're moving into feature film development next. Um, and we've got one of the short films that I made last year. We've got the, the feature length version of that made. Um, and we're just in the process of you know, seeking fund, funding for that. And again, with the One Note Man, you never know with the One Note Man. The writer, uh, George, he's excited by an idea of, of expanding it into a feature film. This idea of you know paying homage to the silent movie era, which I, the short film does. Um, he's 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 come up with an idea where we can expand on the one note man and, and build that into a feature. So, you know, who knows? Like, what if anything happens in the next few weeks with the BAFTA and and, and Oscar noms? A lot of people, more people, want to talk to you, mm -hmm. and 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 a lot more doors hopefully will open, and we can get in front of people and, and pitch these ideas. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, for us at the moment, it's about just slowly building and putting ourselves into a position where yeah more opportunities will present themselves you know the further up the the, the food chain we go how how long has this have you had this production company two years okay. so I, I i made i made a short film when I, a couple of short films when i came out of drama school 15 years ago um and and they did they did they did all right actually but we were just playing you know we, we were just playing it we don't you know and, and then we all Anybody involved? So me and my production part, uh, producing partner, we were um, we were drama students together. We went to drama school together, and there was a circle of us, a circle of our friends, four or five of us that um, have, have stuck together since drama school. We're all still best of friends, and we're all still in the industry. But we've all found our little niches within the industry. Not all of us are acting. Um, some have gone into writing, some have gone into directing and editing and things like that. But collectively, we're all still really close pals. So it's it's an amazing little community that we've got that we all still bounce off each other. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of so. The, so then myself and Luke set up Cusp Films a couple of years ago. Well, we all because we we had a bit of a break. We all went off and had families and had kids and did all that. And very <laughs> very difficult to maintain a uh, or trying to build a production company while you've got three babies screaming. <laughs> um, and then things have things have mellowed out for everybody a little bit, and we said, well. Should we get the old gang back together and, and see what we can do? And, uh, and, and that's what we've done. Um, and then, so that was two years ago and we've, we've created the, the three short films that we set. We did a two year plan to, to do three short films and that's done now. And, um, I'm, you know, I'm happy. I love short films. I absolutely love short films and I'll always champion them. I think they're an amazing, it's an amazing medium to do, but you know, I would never advise anybody to get into it. Because it's not for the faint-hearted. Yeah. You've got to, you've got to be, you've got to back, you've got to really back yourself, and you've got to have the energy because they're so time-consuming yeah. and they're so uh, financially crippling. Sometimes not crippling, but you know they, you look at them pound for pound, and you don't get much for your. Yeah. Book, no, I think crippling is the right yeah. word. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> I was, I'm trying to be polite for camera. Like, yeah. Uh, no. So uh, the bank manager. <laughs> so uh, we want to respect your time. This has been an awesome conversation. Is there anything you'd like to promote? You know, obviously the the short film, but uh, anything that you want to talk about before we get out of here? No, I think so. Look, we're just extremely grateful for for, for people like you that are giving us the chance to to promote this side of the film. And look, short films are an amazing uh, amazing platform for for all independent filmmakers. So long may that continue, and long may the, the likes of you give us that opportunity to talk about them. Because that's you know that's what we do. We we make the films to be to be talked about, not just to sit on a not just to sit on a on a shelf. And that's a prime example. You you've just brought up a, a short film that was made twenty years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, 
you know, we, we don't want to want to make short films for them to sit on a platform and get lost. We want to sit and dissect them and talk about them because that's why we love film and, and, and long may that continue. So, yeah, thank you for, for your time and, and allowing us to do it. It is our honor, honestly. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, whenever whenever y'all can, whenever it's available anywhere, we'll put a link in the description. Yep. Yep. The One yep. Note Man. Hopefully you'll be seeing it at the Oscars. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Fingers yeah. crossed.